Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another edition of the Federalist Radio Hour. I'm Christopher Bedford, and joining me today are Senator Jim DeMint and Rachel Bovard. He is the founder of CPI, he's a member of the Coronavirus Task Force, and the author of a new book, Saving America from Socialism. And Rachel's a founding member of CPI, along with the senator and a senior member of the Internet Accountability Project. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for having us. So, Senator, this, this book just came out, uh, but it's, we've seen it before because you've had to write something rather similar before. So it's an update. And when the country was going through another beginning realm of socialism, essentially, before the presidency of Barack Obama, or at the beginning of the presidency of uh, Barack Obama, since then, it's been about 10 years, and a lot in America has changed. What what caused you to, to think that this, this, this point needs to be remade so thoroughly and, and to address it with the vehicle that you'd originally use as well? Well, Chris, um, when I first put the book out in 2009, uh, Barack Obama had just come into office and beginning to talk about the uh, t uh, government takeover of health care. A lot of the policies that were being um, pushed at the time were very government-centric. I saw a lot of shift towards Washington control of education, health care. Uh, and at the time, it just, I called it a slide towards socialism. I was warning that these things seemed to be taking us in the wrong direction and talked about the history of socialism around the country, with, which Rachel and I have written extensively about, uh, not just around our country, but around the world. Um, and so the, at the time, it was warnings. Uh, but now, Chris, uh, we put this book back out because the election is a decision between socialism and freedom of, of whether or not uh, people will be able to make decisions in their own lives about their own health care, the education of their children, and states will be able to make more decisions, uh, whether it be about transportation or other things that should be controlled at the state level. But socialism is such a disaster and has been throughout history it's almost hard to contemplate that that is what this election is about. And right now the polls are, are saying they prefer that, which I don't believe. And so part of what I want to do between now and the election, just as an individual, is talk about the differences between free markets, freedom, free enterprise, and what socialism really is. And I know Rachel would like to comment on that because she's written as much about it as I have. <laughs> Well, I think what's really interesting in this current moment is that, you know, when we've talked about socialism in the past, it's sort of been, you know, this government creep, government overreach, this sort of totalitarian, authoritarian, top-down control of our so sort of social institutions. But I think we're also really seeing a new part of it that's unmasked itself lately, and that's this insidious form of thought control, um, you know, which is inherently a Marxist socialist concept. Um, and I, I think it really gets back to this idea, you know, it's this logical conclusion of our education system, which for, for years now has been saying, well, you know, there, everything is really relative. There's no absolute truth. There's no principles to be uncovered. It's merely your experience and my experience. And when there's no self-evident truth, everything just becomes about the triumph of the will, right? And that is inherently a Marxist slogan. And you're seeing that right now, I think, in a lot of our rhetoric uh, surrounding, you know, some of the Black Lives Matter protests, um, how we're, you know, leftists are sort of trying to tear down society and recreate it in their own image. All of that is inherently a socialist impulse. Um, and it's, it's at a level that we have not seen before. So I think this conversation, <laughs> it, it was a, a warning for a long time. And now like the red light is flashing. We actually, it's here. We need to deal with it. They aren't hiding it anymore. I, I mean, people, uh, Senator, you've written and, and Rachel, you've seen that a lot of Democrats would never campaign, at least in the, in the general election on the party of socialism. Maybe they might govern with some socialist tendencies, but they wouldn't campaign on it. Now they must campaign on it if you're to win a Democratic primary. I mean, Joe Biden didn't, he actually may have pushed back a little bit more than the other members of the Democratic Party and, and originally ran as a moderate. But since then, he's, he's broken ranks and gone and shifted to the left dramatically, trying to get his party's base behind him. What's, what's changed in America? Is this all just education or is it 
Is it technology and social media's ability to spread it? Is it a misunderstanding of what socialism is? Or, or do Americans, are they actually a socialist people now or leaning that way? I think Rachel hit it uh, correctly. A lot of this comes out of an education system that has taught that this idea of socialism, of sharing, of, of uh, uh, the only way that we're going to get equality is for the government to control more economic activity. And our universities have gone completely over to the socialist, anti-capitalist side now. So a lot of this is coming out of our education system. And, and the majority of millennials today think socialism is a better idea than capitalism. But if you look beneath the hood, Chris, on what these people really understand about socialism, they don't understand it. They, they see it as something that is about justice and equality and fairness. They don't understand what it means when the government begins to tell you what businesses are essential, what businesses are, uh, where you can go, who you can meet with, uh, whether you can go to church or which churches are essential. Now, all this may sound familiar because we've been doing it all for the last few months, but that's a little glimpse of, of socialism that I hope young people will see is when you can't go to the beach because someone tells you it's for your own good, uh, that's what happens when you give too much control to people. Chris, something you said I think is really interesting is sort of, of the at, around social media in this moment. And I think there's a lot of, of things going on here. You know, a lot of what we're seeing isn't new in some senses, right? You know, we've seen major protest movements before. Um, a lot of what we're seeing in the Black Lives Matter movement, I think some of it, sort of the um, like anarchy tendencies go back to the Black Power movement of the 1960s and, and 70s. And I want to make that distinct, right? That's different and distinct from the civil rights movement, which to a great extent was couched in the ideals of the American founding, right? The, the civil rights movement said, we aren't living up to our founding premise of equal rights for everyone under the law. That was the, the right way to approach it. The Black Power movement, I think like some, like the Antifa sections of the Black Lives Matter, Matter movement basically just says, you know, we need to burn America down and recreate it in our own image, which is this sort of morally relativistic, you know, strongman empire. Um, but the difference between then and now, I think in both of those movements is the advent of social media and its ability to amplify um, algorithmically this viral outrage and confirmation bias at a scale we've never seen before, and one that really allows us to feast on each other, and, and on which these platforms make money from us doing so, so they continue to incentivize it. Um, you know, I heard someone describe it recently as um, sort of a mediated empiricism, where we're given a tiny amount of information that's probably not the whole story, in most cases it's not. And you know, it, it just, creates havoc and, and mass cancellation and viral outrage. And at the end of that, there are very real consequences, but no one is held accountable because it's spun up by these platforms that again, make money from us sort of, you know, godzilla each other online. And so I think that's a huge difference between then and now. And it's, it's spinning this moment out of control in ways that I'm not sure we even know how to, how to manifest or deal with. It seems like something shifted in the in the tech companies. I mean, when I when I started in news media in two thousand nine two thousand ten, the internet and the the ability for everyone to have a say in conversations really gave us all a start. Within five, six, seven, eight years, instead of getting coffee, maybe if we'd been lucky for it, for an anchor at one of the major stations, we had we had access to large platforms. The ability to create. Uh, alternative media, the ability to spread facts that were outside of what the Washington Post and New York Times were generally interested in. Uh, it, was, it was a place of vibrancy, it seemed, for a period. And a place, even places like Twitter were somewhere where certain people could maybe make a, a name for themselves, make a career. Now it seems like the internet's becoming less vibrant. Uh, places, new sites like the Federalists are targeted by Google, then backtracked. Places like the Daily Caller have difficulty getting advertisers because they're getting boycotted all the time. And Twitter is a place where you go to get fired from your job, not hired for the next job. <laughs> what, what is that shift? Is that just the companies freaking out that, that Donald Trump won the presidency and the thing that gave Barack Obama so much power is now being used by Republicans as well? Or is it something in the society? Well, I think a little bit of, of both, you know, it, 
we t I don't think the answer is necessarily binary, but I think to a great extent, like to your point, these companies, these platforms were the outsiders, right? They, they challenged sort of the, the established ways of, of gathering information and spreading information, but now they've become, I think, the established gatekeepers for information and they wield that in a very powerful way and in a very biased way. Um, and I think that that's a huge shift. You know, these, these platforms are monopolies at the end of the day. Like they have monopolies over information, but their ability to, to wield that power also has ramifications for elections, for human behavior, for privacy, for speech, for all of these sort of existential questions that together sort of create a social fabric. So it's not, it's not good enough, I think, to say simply, well, this is just private companies you know, operating in the, in the free market. What we're dealing with is so much larger than that and the ramifications are so intense that it's, this is not just a market question, this is a societal question. And you know, I think that's starting to sink in. Members of Congress are starting to realize that, uh, but not everybody does yet. Well, uh, Chris, we, we need to realize where the money is here. A big corporate America, who they funded broadcasting for years through their ads, are, are now funding a, a lot of what goes on in the internet. And like you mentioned, if, if you can't sell advertising, they're going to be able to run you out of business. So a big shift in the last 10 years is that corporate America has moved as far to the left as the Democrat Party, and they are funding a lot of what's going on today and, and actually uh, creating a monopoly along with the internet of, of who can survive and, and who can't. Um, and that's something we really need to look at is corporate responsibility here and corporate uh, money on the left blending itself with these huge tech companies that sell data for things that they give us for free. And for a long time, I think all of us just thought this was wonderful, we get all this stuff for free, but they're selling our data. And uh, unfortunately, government's become a big part of buying that data from the tech companies. And so it gets back to crony capitalism between the government and a big business, big tech right now. Um, but the, the good news is, I think the internet is still a big, vast uh, frontier of freedom. And it's our job to figure out how to wean out the monopoly power that some have, have gotten and figure out how to keep that frontier open. And, and there's, the, there's a crony capitalism, Senator, that Republicans have long talked about, that hand in glove partnerships between private corporations who get an upper hand in other corporations through, through government access. But Amazon and Google are different. The East India Company and some of the most powerful private companies in history are, don't have nearly the influence or control that modern tech companies have over the day-to-day -day lives of Americans. We used to think that having an army was the greatest thing now, but instead they can control what you see and in a large, large part what you think and how you interact with each other in a way that private armies never could. But at the, since you wrote this book last, a lot of people on the right, including yourself, Tucker Carlson, Senator Hawley, have come out against these sort of things. And it does fit with, with Friedrich Hayek's thinking on this, you quote throughout the book, that anyone who becomes a monopoly must be made a whipping boy of capitalism and not, not, its, not its hero. But these ideas were called socialist by a lot of people in the GOP in 2009, and people uh, like Holly and, and Tucker are still criticized today as being have, having forsaken that capitalist mantra and the old Republican ideas. So, so, so with with Hayek and, and who, who you quote and, and, and your change and your shift towards a more holding these companies accountable idea, how do you answer that criticism that holding Google or taking government power, which Amazon doesn't need to have power, taking government power to to impact their hold on information, on trade, on, on manufacturing, is a good thing for conservatives to want to do and America to want to do? Well, that's an easy one to answer because monopolies destroy capitalism. They, they, they root out competition and, and, and create barriers to entry. And so it's always been a part of a government function in a capitalist society to identify monopolies, uh, break them up, whether it be AT&T years ago. And, and it's, it's a tough call, I mean, it, and it requires some wisdom, but it should not be tough at this point to look at what's going on uh, with Google, 
but also with Amazon, that a lot of small producers now across the country cannot sell individually. They have to sell through Amazon. It was part of why Amazon wanted the, the, the sales tax to work on the internet because it's so complicated that all these small companies essentially have to sell through Amazon to keep all of that straight. But I think it's the role of, of our government to come in, identify monopolies, and if there's not competition and if fair trade is not going on, then it's, it's the job of a conservative a capitalist to, to make sure the market works. And it's not working now in the tech business. Yeah, I think that that's a really interesting point that you raised, Chris, because it is the push, the central pushback, I think, from some in the GOP against any action on these tech companies. And I think it's a fundamental misunderstanding of, of the free market in and of itself, kind of what Senator DeMint was alluding to. You know, the free market doesn't mean what is good for big corporations. It means what is good for everyone in the, that's participating in the market, both consumers and producers, and particularly small businesses. And that's what we're seeing here is that small businesses are just being stomped out of existence. Um, you had several of them come before Congress in January, just begging them to take action because these big companies were going so far as to just steal the intellectual property of these small competitors because they could, because they're so large that they can put these companies out of business to no, to no ramifications at all. And so I think it's incumbent upon people who uh, support the free market upon, upon capitalists to say, the small businesses are the innovators here. You know, we do need to make sure it's a fair playing field for them as well. And I, but I think from a broader perspective, it also gets to you know, how we protect liberty. The government is not the only threat to liberty in this country. Corporations and mega corporate power can also be a threat to liberty. And that I think is something that um, you know, not corporatist libertarians, but general libertarians understand because there's inherent skepticism in libertarianism that is skeptical of concentrations of power, whether they exist in the government or at the corporate level. William F. Buckley was famous for saying, I will not cede any of my power to the government or to General Motors. And I think his, his statement is still applicable, just replace General Motors with Google, and there you have it. And Chris, a, a big part of socialism is what we call crony capitalism, where the government becomes uh, allied with some of these big biz business interests. And we, we see a parallel with the, in the tech industry with, with trade in general. Conservatives, Republicans are very much for free trade. And there was a lot of criticism of clamping down on uh, bad players like China. But if there really is going to be free trade, it has to be free trade with, with, with laws and rules that both sides follow. When you don't enforce those rules, it all begins to deteriorate, as we've seen with China and some other countries. Uh, so uh, I think conservative free market principles have some guiding principles that you have to, you have to guard. Otherwise, you lose the, uh, the free market idea altogether. Yeah, that's true. I think all of that. And, and Rachel, I'd actually, I don't think I'd heard that Bill Buckley quote. I wonder if that made it at all awkward for him visiting Ronald Reagan in his General Motors home, <laughs> his GM sponsored house where everything was provided by General Motors when he was back, when he was a spokesman. Maybe they didn't know each other back then. That, but a lot, has, a lot has changed on the right, uh, Senator and, and Rachel, in the last 11 years. If you go back to 2009 and look at who was, who were the most influential voices on the right, the people who were the real power holders, the, or 2009, then 2010, then 2011, uh, the Kochs were very major, uh, at least they were starting to become that. National Review was maybe the top magazine, the Weekly Standard was up there. The, the Bush family, uh, even though the pre President Bush had just left, still had a huge amount of sway in the Republican Party. Um, the columnists who have since passed or have since changed some of their ideas are now opposing like the sitting Republican president from George Will, who I know is a friend of yours, uh, to Charles Krauthammer, who we've since lost. Uh, a lot has seems to have changed in those, in the 11 years since you published these books. Do you, do you think that what you've seen and, and you found it also conservative partnership Institute to try and train, train uh, young conservative Senate staffers and Hill staffers and people in the media and connect connect people on how to make an impact like you both did when you were in the Senate. Have you seen, are you, do you find these changes positive? Do you think that they still need to continue? Some of your allies like Tucker Carlson have said that they still need to continue and have 
in particular targeted the Heritage Foundation, uh, where you used to be. Are you, do you find these changes to be positive? What, what do you want to see continue to change? And, and where do you think things have gone right and where they think they've gone wrong? Well, I think uh, the Republican Party needs a lot of improvement, particularly here at, at the national level. They, we've always been battling what we call the Republican uh, establishment um, that's mixed in with big corporate money, that, that the same corporate money that supports a lot of folks on the left. And, um, and so uh, that seems to have always been my battle in Washington. And I think it's, it's been all the way back to Rockefeller Republicans versus Reagan Republicans. It's, it, there's always a tension but the establishment swamp-like Republicans are tied in with a, a lot of big money here in DC. And we've taken them on with Senate Conservatives Fund with some success over the past when I was involved with that. Um, but it, they are uh, hard to fight. And right now I'm very concerned about Republicans because they seem to have just submitted and accepted the, the trillion dollar debt and the continued spending there's very little talk of the need to regain some fiscal sanity. The Federal Reserve is essentially out of control with what it's doing with our monetary system. You just don't hear a lot from Republicans on the, the basic principles of fiscal responsibility and balanced budgets. And they seem to have accepted a lot of the government centric ideas that we have to do everything from the um, federal level. Uh, I mean, Donald Trump, while I don't know that he's ideologically a conservative, he is a very pragmatic person in trying to get the right things done. And uh, it's been hard for him to get the Republican Party to come along with ideas that Republicans have support, uh, supported for years. So I think we're in a state of flux at the national level, and I would be distraught if I didn't go out all around the country and see at the state and local level, many cases, there are a lot of fantastic Republicans working to save our country. And I, I think the, the bench for conservatives is, is fairly deep across the country. We just need more national leadership. Yeah, I think it's, a, it's obviously a, a time of turmoil, I think, for the Republican Party. But I think for conservatives, you know, and it's also a time of turmoil for conservatives, as you point out, right? There's a whole host of fractures on this point, but I really think part of that comes from the fact that I think conservatives, some Republicans have, have gotten really entrenched about their ideology, right? And, and, and conservatism, if you go back to its root, you know, Senator DeMitt and I wrote a book last year on Russell Kirk and conservatism. Kirk was was famous for pointing out that conservatism, conservatism is distinct from ideology. Ideology is what the left gives us. It's reflexive. It's a, a set of policy prescriptions that you must not diverge from or else you are heretical. For some reason, I think Republicans have adopted this position and it's, it's led them astray. It's led them to, to I think, teetering toward irrelevance because it, it, they're not, nothing that they're talking about is applicable to, to grassroots conservatives who really feel that their way of life is under assault. Right? They, they really feel like in five years, you know, they, their way of life may not be here anymore because the left has no qualms about trying to stamp it out at every possible level. And here's the Republican Party saying, well, you know what's going to solve that? Another capital gains tax cut. <laughs> and it just doesn't <laughs> line up anymore. And, but, I, but I, you know, and there's some people who say, well, we can't abandon our principles. Well, that's not what our conservative principles say. If you go back to, again, Kirkian conservatism, let's just take one, one thinker. His principles of conservatism were accumulated tradition, private property, prudence, you know, equality of rights and a strong civil society, among many others. And he was very famous for saying that that looks different in every generation. It is what allows conservatism to thrive because it takes on the challenges of its moment and it never leaves its principles, but it doesn't, ab it doesn't abandon them for this reflexive ideology that says, if you don't support the World Trade Organization, you are not conservative. Like, I think that thinking has served us very poorly. And so what I, I think you're seeing now is a, is a resurrection of that sort of the Kirkian moment, which is to say, you know, we are a practical party that says our principles can apply to these present problems, whether they be big tech, you know, whether it be the rise of China, uh, you know, whether it be the decimation of, of blue collar rural America, conservatives can have answers to these questions. We have tremendous thinkers who have taught us how to do this. We've lost that ability, but I think we're, trying to gain it back. 
Yeah, I mean, I think we see with the Federalists that we see with, uh, as Rachel mentioned, some Daily Caller, Breitbart, not that we all always get it right, but there's a, an alternative voice now that's helping, I think, to consolidate conservative thought. And, and Rachel and I would really like to get across this idea that, that this, this idea that there's 10 steps to being a conservative generally misses the point, particularly if you wrap it in just political policy. A conservative is a worldview. Um, and just looking at those things that work and have worked over time and that we can, how do we figure out how to bring them forward? Uh, and I think if we presented our ideas in that way, it would be much more attractive to young people. But um, I, I'm not giving up at all. I'm, I'm continuing to be optimistic. Uh, I'm, I have seen if you present reasonable thoughts to most Americans, uh, they're, they're ready to, to listen. Uh, but that's how, what we have to figure out, Chris. How, how can we speak to more Americans, particularly between now and November, to let them know what's at stake here? And there really is a choice between this idea of socialism and what is really truly American. So, so let's name some names, if we can, on, on the GOP, because these are, these are real leaders and these are prominent people who listeners and friends and donors and all kinds of people vote for it and support. And you've been trying to fight this for a long time, uh, the two of you, uh, Senator, with your Senate Conservatives Fund, uh, which I know you since you've left a few years ago. But that was something that raised money to help it so that you weren't the only senator who was in the Republic, uh, a, con a staunchly conservative senator uh, on the Republican side back before there was the Wacko Birds, as they called them. It was just you, and before that, maybe Helms and a few other people. But you talk about in your book or write about that you raised millions of dollars to help elect bold conservatives like Mike Lee, Ted Cruz, Rand Paul, Pat Toomey, Ron Johnson, and many other promising candidates in the U.S. Senate. But only a few of these new representatives kept their promises to fight for freedom. So who are some of the disappointments? <laughs> I'm not going to give you that. <laughs> I'm still trying to resurrect a lot of them who came up. Uh, really, most Republicans campaign on what we call conservatism. It's just that they get here and quickly lower their expectations because they seem so unrealistic. Uh, and part of what we do at the Conservative Partnership is just to create an environment where those ideas and those people can thrive and feel like there's some support for them because otherwise you're gonna feel like you're nuts up here if you're talking about, hey, what about balancing the budget? And, and nobody responds. <laughs> uh, so we've got a lot of work to do, but I think I see some good happening in some alternative media, what we're doing at CPI. There's some good uh, groups that we're partnering with here and all over the country. So uh, this is not a good time to, uh, to let up. And in fact, uh, I think the next few months might be the most important time in the conservative movement. I do think it's worth making the point though, that like the Senate at large, right? The Senate has been governed by Republicans for the entirety of Trump's term in office for two years. It, we, the Republicans had complete control of the government and you know, we got nothing as, as conservatives. You know, we got tax cuts, which you know, is good. But considering that we had full control of the government, we got nothing for cultural conservatives, for traditional conservatives. Um, and I think the crowning achievement of the Senate was to get an industrial hemp sector in Kentucky. <laughs> so, you know, I think there's something to be said for the, the politicians that we elect trying to be relevant. Because right now, I think people are, conservatives across the country are looking for Congress to become relevant, to stand up for them, to, to stand up in the face of abject assault. I think from the left on, on virtually every area of their lives. And you have a group of, of senators that's staring at their shoes. And I think that has been a problem and continues to be a problem. It's, we try to address it here at CPI. I'm constantly teaching Senate staff <laughs> how, to, how to force votes in the Senate. But I think it's a broader problem of our politicians, you know, lacking that sort of moral courage that makes them statesmen. And so that's something I think that they need to resurrect quickly uh, or they're gonna become, I think, completely irrelevant to the, to the conversation and to conservatives more generally. And that seems like something that we've completely lost in the coronavirus debate, uh, which Senator, I know you're on the task force for the federal task force. The, in, the, in this debate, we've lost all statesmanship. Whenever you, I, I hear a politician say, well, I'm gonna let the science speak to that. 
that's someone who's not taking into account the people, uh, the economy, defense, personal well-being, churches, religious liberty, their constitutional duty. To let any one of those just completely dominate your thinking is not what a statesman ought to be doing. Is, does anyone stand out as a statesman today? It's hard to know. Um, I found sometimes when I was trying to do the right thing, uh, no one would cover it, so no one really knew who was speaking out and saying things. It's usually when I said something stupid that I would get all the coverage. But <laughs> I think there's some very bright minds and certainly potential statesmen in the House and the Senate, certainly some with the courage to stand up. It's just hard to get your arms around what will be constructive in a time like this, and no one wants to vote against some bill that's supposed to help people in crisis, even though the bill might be 60 or 70 percent of something you didn't want. Uh, but I think this is a time where people really need to stand up and, and show their courage and say this is nonsense. Uh, for me, it's time to get our country back to normal. There are always risk involved with everything we do, uh, but it's time to do what's best for our country and for the people who live in it. And, and we cannot continue to do what we're doing now and expect to have a thriving, prosperous nation next year. You were closely, in, you've been closely involved in the judges fight. Uh, you stood be, beside the president and I think he embraced you once shortly after um, the confirmation of one of President Trump's Supreme Court justices. Uh, and these people were put up there and they were fought hard for and they, it was very difficult to get, uh, for example, Kavanaugh confirmed against the Democratic attacks that he faced. Since then, though, some of these judges have come under attack from social conservatives for letting them down. And it seems to be a trend that some are noticing where the judges will definitely rule correctly and they're to the right of anyone uh, else on the court, mostly, who rule in a way that conservatives favor on the economy, on business, on, on elections, on guns, but rarely can they be counted on for social issues. How, having been in this town and worked in this town for years, the two of you, and had to deal with a lot of the background, uh, the backroom fights and the public fights to get conservative judges across the finish line, what do you think of those complaints from social conservatives on being left behind in that front, and, and how would you suggest fixing those, because I know those are matters that, that you hold dearly as well. Well, I know I'm certainly concerned and I've certainly been disappointed. Uh, John Roberts is um, a huge disappointment. And I'm afraid once these judges taste the adulation of the left, it's, it's hard to get them back. And it, I, it's, the problem there is just like in the House and the Senate and the administration that there's just no reward for doing the right thing. I mean, we may think we support them when they, they do the right thing, but Clarence Thomas doesn't speak at, at many um, um, universities or, uh, or high level uh, Ivy League schools. Um, I mean, you just, if you do the right thing, you don't get um, the, the adulation that you do. Uh, and we don't ever know quite what we're getting when we put these judges in, but on the social issues, um, I don't know. I, I have been disappointed. There have been some good uh, decisions related to uh, the potential growth of school choice and things like that. So it's, it's been a mixed bag, uh, but I think we need to do as, as much as we can to create some positive uh, noise on the outside for doing the right things, because I know the judges uh, listen to the news and read their mail too. So I think this is a really critical point because of the fact that the Republicans the Republican Party for years now has made judges their legislative strategy. And this is why I think what we saw from the Supreme Court this term was such a gut punch to social conservatives, traditional conservatives in particular, because for years, Republicans, particularly in the Senate, told religious conservatives, well, we don't have to fight for you because the judges will do it. And this is how we're doing it. We're confirming these judges who are going to give you everything you want. And that was completely dismantled in a matter of months, uh, the Supreme Court term. I think to a great extent, we will be unraveling this Bostock decision and its ramifications for traditional conservatives and for genuine people of, of genuine faith, of any faith, are gonna be so impacted by this decision. And I think that's an indictment of one, 
judges as a legislative strategy. We know this doesn't work. You, there is no silver bullet for actually passing bills in Congress to for social conservative issues and to protect the conservative way of life. But I think the second point is that our process for, for vetting these judges and confirming these judges, we didn't quite get it right <laughs> because we were told all these judges were great on social issues and, and they haven't been. And anyone who questioned that, you've mentioned Josh Hawley, Senator Hawley tried to vet conservatives on the, conservative judges on this issue and was smacked down and smacked around routinely by the conservative legal establishment. So there needs to be some self-reflection on the part of conservatives, particularly in the judicial establishment, to say, did we get it right? How can we fix it going forward? And I think the fact that we've seen no reflection from either Congress or the conservative legal movement is concerning to conservatives and I think should be, because again, these are the people that we've tasked with protecting our values, protecting our political way of life, and they don't seem very intent on doing it. No. You, you write this book, Senator, and it's in some ways, well, it, it hits on some lofty ideas, it, a lot of lofty ideas. In some ways, it's in a way that's rather understandable. It begins a lot of its chapters with familiar children's stories. Uh, America's children are going through a lot right now, as, as you've talked about, Rachel, with the education system when they get a little older. But right now, the children are hearing from the news that they should be afraid, a lot, a lot of the news. The schools are shut down, the teachers won't teach them, and when the teachers do teach them, they're teaching them to hate the country uh, and after they get maybe to grade four, and about gendered pronouns and, and all kinds of different uh, left-wing programs. What would you have, what would you say to the young people and to, and to parents who might be listening who'd be interested in buying this book, uh, Saving America from Socialism, on the lesson for, for younger members of their family and if, how they might enjoy this and, and what they're getting from their education system and, and what they should draw from this, this un, unbelievable exercise in federal power, I mean, greater than anything we probably saw domestically, even in World War II, for a clampdown on civil rights. Chris, it's a great question. The reason I, I wrote the book is I know that you lose the things you care about if you don't understand how you got them uh, or how meaningful they are. Sometimes we don't know how good they were until we lose them and then it's too late. So uh, the, the book Saving America from Socialism, it, it talks about what makes America work. It also talks about the greatest threat, which is socialism and centralized government power. And I think the best part of the book is the end. What can we do about it as individual citizens? Every person has a role to play. You don't have to be in politics, but just part of being an American and part of being a citizen is what makes America work. Because we're, we're built from the ground up with millions of people making their own decisions about how they want to live. And one of the recommendations is, I, I think the most important is we need to have more education choices. We need to have education savings accounts where the money follows the students, where parents can pick schools and there can be competition of schools. We, we've got to move away from the model of government education. If we don't, we're going to have more government in every area of our lives. And there's still time. There are a number of states doing this. We don't have to pass a major bill in Washington. Hopefully we can pass a few things that will get the federal government to opt out of control. Uh, so I'm optimistic that every citizen can make a difference, but you can't if you don't understand the things that make America work and the biggest threats that we have right now, which is socialism. So Rachel, a lot of people get there would, would want to buy Saving America from Socialism from Jeff Bezos' Amazon. Uh, dot com, but where would you buy it as an opponent of Amazon? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a big proponent of um, a couple of places. One, I mean, local bookstores, they're a, they're a dying species, but they do still exist. Um, I used to, I lived on Capitol Hill for a very long time, and the little book libraries that people set up in their neighborhoods, um, I always am a, a contributor and a, and a consumer of those as well. Um, but I, also book shares. I don't know if people still do this, but um, you know, I have a book club and we trade our books when we're done with them. So even during coronavirus. Even during coronavirus. <laughs> wow, that's very brave of you. <laughs> I'm a profile in courage. What can I say? 
Well, you can get it from Bar Bar Barnes and Noble online, or you can make a contribution to the Conservative Partnership, and we'll send you a free book. <laughs> And, and CPI does work, uh, a lot of work, very interesting work to kind of train uh, young Senate conservatives and up and coming staff and members and how to generally do navigate the very complicated systems of American government and to understand how they could have, how, how their boss can have an impact on, uh, on Capitol Hill and actually even, even if they're not in charge of the GOP. So I guess I know you have to go soon, but if you could tell me a little bit tell our listeners a little bit about what the Conservative Partnership Institute does and, and what makes it different from all the other think tanks which have existed for decades in Washington. Well, we're not a think tank at all. And part of our philosophy, Chris, is we don't duplicate what other people are doing. We partner with a lot of groups. Um, some of the uh, think tanks, uh, we certainly do some work with the political groups, grassroots groups. Uh, so we work with a lot of the different conservative groups. But one of the most important things I think that we can do, and Rachel leads that effort and I'll let her talk about it, but I found in the Senate, one person can make a big difference if you know how the place works. But you have to know a lot about the parliamentary procedures and how, how to offer amendments or how to go down and hold something so it can't go through. And if you hold something that somebody wants, they'll start talking to you about what you want and, and what you want to change. So I had great staff in the Senate, and a lot of them are working here, running uh, the conservative partnership. Or Rachel was there at the, uh, the, the, um, the, the steering committee. Gosh, how quickly I forgot. Uh, Ed Corgan, who is our CEO here, was a head of steering committee and a big part of my staff. Uh, so having the right staff is over 50% of the battle. And if you don't get good staff when you get here as a conservative, you're not going to be a conservative very long. Uh, you're, going to, you're going to go with the flow. You need good people around you who are encouraging you every day. But Rachel, you can talk a little bit more about the, the training and the different courses and how they work. Yeah, a lot of what we try to do here is, is you know, we recognize that there's a lot of groups that work on policy. Um, and that's great. And members and staff can have the best policies, but they, if they don't have the ability of, of maneuvering with the best tactics and strategy and parliament procedure, the best policies are going to go nowhere. And so that's where we, we really come in is we are sort of a tactical and strategic organization. Um, practically speaking, that means I teach a lot of Senate procedure um, and a lot of House procedure. I joke that it's my one like transferable life skill um, that I've, I've managed to impart on others. But a lot of what we do also is just act as a strategic consultant for the conservative movement, you know, gathering people together to focus on tactics and strategy uh, in the face of, again, this all out assault from the left, making sure senators and, and house members, you know, have uh, the procedural knowledge and the tactical ability to make the, not only make the best argument, but have the best strategy as well. And so that's, we're more of an action tank, I guess, in that regard. <laughs> yeah. Your one transferable skill, I, I thought you were also a sommelier and a cigar aficionado, if I recall correctly. <laughs> That's true. In politics, or probably in spite of politics, I've, I've developed those um, transferable life skills as well. So when this all, when we all have to go to the underground bunker, I'll have the one with the good wine. We'll get the smoking one too. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Senator DeMint. Thank you very much, Rachel, uh, for joining us. Uh, Senator DeMint's book, Saving America from Socialism, is available now. Uh, this has been another edition of the Federalist Radio Hour. You can follow us on social media at the Federalists and uh, at Federalists. And until next time, be lovers of freedom and anxious for the fray. <laughs>